Pokemon Emerald released in North America over 16 years ago now, and it is by far one of my most played Pokemon games in the series. I remember being so excited when this game was coming out, and I still have the pre-order bonuses I got with this game. One thing I never had until very recently though was this official Prima guide for Pokemon Emerald licensed by Nintendo. Today, we're going to try to beat Pokemon Emerald by following this guide exactly acting as much like a new player as possible, and seeing if this really is the best way to beat Pokemon Emerald as a new player. This video is sponsored by Bai. Bai is a proxy shipping service that lets you purchase items from Japanese web stores like Mercari, Amazon Japan, and Yahoo Japan, while shipping them straight to you even if you live outside of Japan like I do. This is great since many Japanese stores don't ship directly outside of Japan themselves, so Bai actually buys the products on your behalf and then ships it to your door for a fee. This allows you to get Japanese exclusive products if you live in America like I do, such as cool Japanese exclusive Pokemon merchandise, Cardfight Vanguard merchandise, and they even have multilingual support if you don't speak Japanese. By using Bai, you can buy anything from Japan without living in Japan. If you use the link in the description, you will get 2,000 yen off of your first purchase at Bai, which is just under $20, which is pretty cool. So taking a look at this guide, and it looks just like any other strategy guide from the early 2000s would. I personally prefer these older guides from this era over newer guides from say 2010 onwards or so, since they tend to be a little bit weirder and a bit less polished than newer guides, which makes reading them more fun. The start of this guide summarizes the game by telling us what we need to do to become the champion of the Hoenn region and stop Team Aqua and Team Magma from taking over the world. My favorite line from this preview part of the guide reads, You are again cast as a young adventurer, arriving fresh-faced in Hoenn without a single Pokemon to your name. Your goal is to change that. It then goes on to explain that in order to catch them all and complete the Pokedex, you'd need more than just your copy of Pokemon Emerald, which only has about 200 obtainable Pokemon in it, and you'd also need Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire version, a second Game Boy Advance with a Link Cable, and possibly a GameCube and Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon Box, which is one of the hardest GameCube games to ever obtain. Pokemon XD Gull of Darkness isn't listed here since it came out a few months later, I'm guessing. And I don't think that many people realize just how hard it is to catch them all legitimately in the Generation 3 Pokemon games, especially before Emerald version was released. The next few pages then detail some mechanics like fishing and trading, and even warns you against trading over high level Pokemon from older Pokemon games to beat this game easier. It also randomly has this picture of a berry here, I think it's an orange berry, although it says nothing about berries anywhere around this page, but don't worry, there is still a full and intact berry page towards the back of the guide that lists all of the berries in this game. A few pages down, we start seeing some of the first mistakes in the guide, and I want to give a shout out to Bulbapedia for having a whole webpage dedicated to this guide and all of the errors. First, it says that Wurmple evolving into Silcoon or Cascoon is affected by the time of day, although this is false and Wurmple will just randomly evolve into Silcoon or Cascoon, and the Pokedex section in the back even says that Wurmple's evolution is random. I guess it would have made sense for these to be day-night evolution Pokemon, and perhaps that was planned early in development in Scrat for some reason, but it's definitely not the case in the final release of the game. On that same page though, it also lists all of the egg groups for breeding in Pokemon Emerald version, and states that the Pokemon in Egg Group 0 can't breed, although some of them, like Electrode, are able to breed with a Ditto. I'm guessing that maybe the egg groups for the guy just didn't take into account Ditto and only accounted for Pokemon of the same species breeding together, but the next few pages show other basic things like the type chart, status effects, and how they work. I thought it was funny how it said how frozen Pokemon have Frostbite. I never really thought about it like that, but I guess that is true. And a full map of the Hoenn region before finally getting into the walkthrough part of the guide. So without further ado, let's load up a brand new save of Pokemon Emerald version and hammer away at it in order to beat it as intended. Starting off, the guide mentions the keys to Hoenn and how this guide will show us what areas we have to visit and what events we need to complete in order to complete the game, and to stock up on Pokeballs for our journey in case we find a Pokemon in the wild that we like. 
The first thing it wants us to do is set our clock, then go downstairs to see our mother. The guide makes no mention of taking out the potion from the PC, which you could do in this game too, although in the listed item sections at the start of the section for Little Road Town, it does say there's a potion here, which I'm guessing is alluding to the potion in the PC, although it doesn't tell us that it's in the PC. We then have to get neighborly and meet our rival, May, which the guide usually just refers to as Professor Birch's kid instead of calling her May or our rival, which I guess would make sense in case you pick the other character at the start of the game. After that, we can head north to rescue Professor Birch from the Zigzagoon and choose our first Pokemon. According to the guide, the options for our starter Pokemon are the Water-type Mudkip, Grass-type Torchic, or Fire-type Trico. The guide accidentally mixed up Torchic and Trico's types it looks like, but goes on to say that there is no correct choice between the starters and to pick the one that we like the most. Since I tend to gravitate towards Grass-type starter Pokémon whenever I play Pokémon, Bulbasaur happens to be my favorite starter Pokémon of all time, by the way, I decided on picking the Grass-type Pokémon in this game too, which was Torchic for this playthrough. From here, we could head north to the township of Oldale Town and get a free potion sample, not head west since west is a no-go apparently, and check out the Pokémon Center for the very first time. Here we can heal our Pokémon, trade Pokémon with other Pokémon players, and use the PC to store extra Pokémon or extra items since our bag isn't bottomless in this game. Now we can head up north to Route 103, and the first thing I see on this page is a shortcut alert for after we get the HM for Surf much later on in the game, to allow us to get to Slateport City faster than it would be to travel all the way around by foot. By the time you do get the HM4 Surf though, you probably wouldn't need to use this shortcut anyway. But on this route, we also have our first rival battle against Professor Birch's child. She has the starter Pokemon that type trumps us being Mudkip, but the guide says that if we keep at it, we'll remain victorious. I send out Torchic that I named Grass, of course, and keep at it like the guide says by going for scratches for the victory. Now we have to flip back a couple of pages to return to Little Root Town and talk to Professor Birch again to get some Pokeballs. I'm not that far into the game yet, and I can already tell that there's going to be a lot of flipping back and forth with this guide. Something that's common for a lot of guides, but even this early on, it seems worse than some other guides that we've looked at with the flipping. After receiving the Pokeball, Balls, though it suggests that we catch something to pad our Pokedex, so I caught a Poochiana which I named Rover and a Lotad that I named Mirror B. Now we can continue along Route 102 where we have our first regular trainer battles for the first time, and the guide says that if we're successful in the battles, we're gonna receive cash, and that we'll need as much cash as possible to shop for needed items. Doesn't exactly tell me what these needed items are, but further along we find our very first berry patch, which I pick of course, and the guide says, quote, when you pick berries, the tree crumbles back to the dirt. You could pocket the berries and keep walking, but that's hardly the neighborly thing to do. You are encouraged to plant berries in the vacant soil so they can grow into new trees. All it takes is one berry to sprout a new tree, so keep one. It then goes on to say that if I plant a lot of berries, I'll eventually have a bumper crop in Hoenn, whatever that means, I guess it's some sort of agricultural term, but I continue along and make it to the township of Petalburg City. The guide also called Little Root Town a township, and I don't know why I found that wording of township funny since it's really not even funny. It then mentions how there is a gym here and quotes, although you cannot compete in the gym yet, patience young trainer, stop in and say hello to a very familiar and familial gym leader. I do just that and meet the gym leader which happens to be our father Norman and shortly after Wally walks into the gym and we have to help him catch his very first Pokemon. The guide says that perhaps having a Pokemon will be enough to turn Wally's health situation around, alluding to the fact that Wally is sick in these games. It's rarely stated in these games that he's actually sick, and it's never exactly explained how or why he got sick or what his sickness even is. So I wonder how the guide writer knew this early on that Wally was actually sick to write about it already. From here, we now have to go through the Petalburg Forest and bring a Pokeball or two, which I do, and meet Team Aqua along the way. After dispatching the Team Aqua Grunt in the forest, we're awarded with a Great Ball and are able to make it to the other side of Route 104, we have to flip back a couple of pages again to get a green thumb and get the Wilmer Pale as well as the TM for Bullet Seed. Continuing along, we have our very first double battle of the game, which the guide details quite well by explaining how double battles work, 
and after defeating them, we can head into the township of Rustboro City. This is a pleasant little burg where we can trade a routes for a C dot if we wanted to, get the HM for cut, and go to the trainer's school. The guide says how even though we have a new hidden machine not to rush the gym and check the school out first yet, although the HM of cut being a normal move wouldn't really help us at all in the gym, but in the trainer's school we get the quick claw that the guide says could help us for the gym. Roxanne's Pokemon in general are pretty slow, and Quick Claw makes it so you have a small chance of attacking first no matter what your speed stat is, so I'm guessing that it suggests that we use the Quick Claw in case our speed gets lowered by one of their attacks or something. The next thing the guide wants us to do is challenge the gym leader Roxanne, of course, although personally I think it would be better to clear out the trainers on the route next to Rustboro for extra XP, but since this is the Nintended series and we have to follow the guide as closely as possible, I battle the gym leader first anyway way, and Mirror B the low tad evolves into Lombre right before I fight Roxanne, which is great. The guide details Roxanne's Pokemon pretty well by saying what types they are as well as their levels, and what the recommended types are to use against them being water and grass. Since I have Lombre, which is a water and grass type, and I guess Torchic, which apparently is a grass type, this battle goes by very smoothly. In the portion of the battle though, the guide recognizes that Torchic is a fire type though, and strongly suggests against using it against Roxanne. Although technically if you evolve Torchic into Combusken at only level 16, it will learn Double Kick, which is good for this gym, and would be only one level above Roxanne's Ace Pokemon Nose Pass at 15. It's definitely not as good as using a Water or Grass type Pokemon, but it's still an option for people who decide to start with Torchic. I listen to the guide anyway and get our first gym badge with Lombre by volleying Grass type moves at her like the guide recommended. As we exit the gym, we see that the Devon Corporation next door has been robbed by Team Aqua, and we have to go and find the thief. Right under this section, there is a tip that says we can get a Premier Ball from the NPC in one of the nearby buildings here, and the guide says to save the Premier Ball because it's special apparently. In reality, the Premier Ball is the exact same thing as a regular Pokeball, but I still manage to get it anyway, and then go into the Rust Earth Tunnel, defeat the Team Aqua Grunt, save Pico for Mr. Briny, and return the Devon goods to the Devon Corporation's president. The funny thing about the Rust Turf Tunnel is the guide recommends that I use repels in it to avoid all of the Whismers, as Whismers are incredibly common here, although this tunnel is so small in general and we barely have to go inside of it to find the Grunt, so I really don't see the point of including this here. The Devon Corporation president then gives us the Pokenab as a thank you for helping him out and then asks us to deliver something to his son in Dufruit Town, which also happens to be the location of the second gym. As I exit Rustboro City and head south, I notice that we have a a rival battle too. This fight wasn't in the original Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire games and it is optional in Emerald version, but the guide makes no mention of it being here for some reason. I did it anyway for the extra XP so Grass could evolve into a Combusken at level 16, and then find Mr. Brownie's cottage we can take us to Duford. The first thing we do in the township of Duford is learn how to fish, apparently, so I caught a Magikarp named it Dragon since I couldn't think of any other name. Then we can talk to these trendy folks, as the guide puts it, whatever that means, who are obsessed with late allowance, I don't know what that means, and then the guide skips to event 4 even though we only went through events 1 and 2 so far, completely omitting event 3, but event 4 is Brawly's gym fight. Brawly is a flying type gym leader apparently in the guide, so we need fighting types and psychic types for it. There is so much wrong with this Brawly section in general that I just don't understand what's going on. It shows his full team and their types, but shows Metatite as only a fighting type Pokemon when it's also part psychic, and it also says that Metatite is at level 19, when in reality it's level 16. In the actual paragraphs for the fight, it recommends flying and psychic moves and says Brawly is a fighting gym which is correct, so I spam Pex with Combusken as it's our only flying move as of right now. I end up losing the first attempt actually because Makuhita is just way too strong, then I forget to buy potions on the second attempt and lose again, only to eventually win once Combusken got to about 22 from all the failed attempts. I don't know why I always tend to struggle against Brawly's gym, especially in Emerald version. And yes, I know that I could have caught a Zubat or something like that in the nearby cave to help us out a lot in the Brawly gym, but since the guy didn't tell us to go there yet and I'm trying to play this as blind as possible, I didn't do it as I'm following the guide as close as I can. The guide only wants us to visit the Granite Cave after defeating Brawly, most likely since we can now use Flash outside of battle thanks 
thanks to having the second gym badge, and you can use Flash to light up parts of the Granite Cave. The guide does mention how you will want Flash, but doesn't tell me how to get it for some reason, even though you get it from the very first NPC you see in the cave, so I just travel through into the darkness to find Steven and deliver the goods to him. I also got this Everstone in the Granite Cave, which the guide thinks is more important than Flash apparently since it got its own section, but Flash didn't. This allows us to take Mr. Briny's ship to Slateport City now, where we can challenge trainers in this beach house to get some free soda pops, visit the Slateport City shipyard, and go into the Oceanic Museum to help Captain Stern after Team Aqua invaded it. In the museum, we also meet this grunt we defeated earlier on in the game in the Rust Turf Tunnel, and the guide states how even though his ego is bruised, he still gives us a gif, which is the TM for Thief. As we leave the museum, the guide makes note of a stranger who is chronicling talented trainers being Scott. Scott didn't appear in the original Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire games, and this isn't the first time we encountered Scott in Emerald version, although it's the first time the guide makes mention of it. After completing the main events in Slateport City for now, the guide suggests that we check out the rest of the city, mainly just the shops near the beach, and after that we can head up north towards Mallville City. The first thing the guide wants to do on this route is explore the Trick House for a free potion, then a catalog cycling road, although we can't go there yet since we don't have a bike, and then it wants us to battle Professor Birch's kid again. The guide makes no mention of her team or their levels or anything like that, and as we continue up north, we are taken into Mallville City. The first event to do here is to get the HM for Rock Smash, get a bike, and then battle Wally in front of the gym. Unlike the most recent rival fight, the guide actually does tell us that Wally only has one Pokemon being Route, and that it's level 16. After dispatching him, our next event is to battle Watson to get our third gym badge. The guide recommends fire, fighting, and ground types for this gym, and luckily we have two of those three types to cover the electric type Pokemon. The guide mistakenly calls Voltorb part Steel type in the section about Watson's team, and then doubles down on this by in the description for the battle it also says that Watson has two Steel types, when in reality he only has one in his Magneton. I end up losing the first time I challenge him, and then a couple of times after that because I kept getting paralyzed and the guide didn't suggest that we use paralyzed heals, but eventually I keep hammering away for the victory giving us our third gym badge. Now the guide wants us to travel to Route 117, shout out to Master Chief, where we can drop off our Poochiena at the daycare, battle some trainers and evolve my Magikarp in the process since it was holding the EXP share, and get into Verdanturf Town which is a smaller township in Hoenn as the guide puts it. There's no gym in Verdanturf but there is the battle tent and maybe it's just me but I feel like the battle tent looks so out of place in Emerald version, but all we really have to do here is speak to Wally at his house and visit the Rust Turf Tunnel so we can break the rocks allowing the people to get through, and as a reward they give us the HM for strength. The guide says that we get the TM for Attract though for some reason, although all I got from them was the Strength HM. With all of that out of the way, we can head north of Mauville to make our way into Fall Arbor Town. On the way, we have to challenge the Winstraight family to get the Macho Brace as a prize out of it, take this TV interview by battling these two reporters, and at the end give a quick statement on the battle that'll air on TV across the Hoenn region. The guide says how TV is a big part of Hoenn, and that our interview could air all over the Hoenn region, so I just said locomotive since it only gave me the option to say one word. I continue our way up north and around the fiery path where we get the TM for secret power on the other side, and eventually through to Route 113. Right before the part about Route 113, the guide finally mentions the Trainer Hill, which is near the Winstraight family towards Mauville. We can't enter it yet, and I still thought it was odd to mention it this late when we encountered it so long ago. On Route 113, all there is to really note is the glass workshop, where we can exchange this ash we get from walking around the area for various items. The guide doesn't say exactly what these items are for, it just says we get this ash by walking around. So I just go past it and go into Fall Arbor Town since I didn't have very much ash to begin with, which the guide says is a small city that has a ton of big city features, like the Battle Tent. The first thing we have to do here is talk to this random NPC who tells us about Team Magma's antics in the area, then see Lynette in the Pokemon Center, visit the Move Tutor, although we can't use it yet since we don't have any heart scales, and eventually into Route 114 where we see Lynette in her house. On the pages about Fall Arbor Town, it does actually detail the battle tent a bit more this time compared to previous battle tent encounters, 
and I chose a picture of Swalot in the section for the battle tent, which I thought was pretty neat, because I love Swalot. Continuing along Route 114, I meet the Fossil Maniac, which is rather pointless since he doesn't share any of his fossils with us, although the boy in the front of the house gives us the TM for Dig. The guy didn't mention that here for some reason, but it does mention that we can get the TM for Roar for free from this person standing right outside near the Fossil Maniac. The guide also says how there are several new Pokemon here on this route, so bring Pokeballs and catch something, so I caught us a Viper, which I named Suchinoko. I continue through the rounds and make it into Meteor Falls, and I notice that the map in the guide for Meteor Falls is brighter than the Meteor Falls that I see in the actual game. I thought that maybe this was some sort of day-night thing, depending on the time of day you enter Meteor Falls, but no, it turns out that Meteor Falls is slightly different in Ruby version and Sapphire version compared to Emerald version, and the guide somehow mistakes use the maps for Ruby and Sapphire and not Emerald. I headed anyway to thwart Team Magma as the guide puts it to save Professor Cosmo. Now we can finally go back to the cable car to make it into Mount Chimney, where we have to help Team Aqua stop Team Magma from whatever they're trying to do. The guide doesn't specifically say what Team Magma is up to, but it does allude to the idea that they are doing something evil and it's worth stopping them. This guide also makes no mention of Team Magma's Pokemon, not even the Team Magma's leader Pokemon, which is like a mini boss battle in this game, or anything like that, but does tell me to get the meteorite since it's easy to forget it, as you're not directly given it, you have to talk to this little statue and pick it up. On my way out of here, we buy a lava cookie and make it into Lava Ridge Town. In this town, we have to visit the hot springs to get an egg, wonder what that will hatch into, check the herb shop, and finally take on Flannery's fire type gym for the fourth gym badge. The recommended types here are water, ground, and rock, and although I do have a water type in our Gyarados, it still has no water moves, so I end up teaching the dig team that we just got not too long ago to Combuskin to help take care of her team pretty nicely, giving us the fourth gym badge. I did notice that the guide messed up a bit here on the type of her camera by listing as being only a fire type when it's a fire and ground type, which seems to be a pretty common thing for this guide as that's not the first time that has happened. Now we can head all the way back to Petalburg City, flipping about 40 pages back in the guide to challenge Norman, the 5th gym leader. His gym is all normal type Pokemon, and I have a fighting type Pokemon in Combuskin, which is slightly over leveled at this point too, so it's able to carry us through the gym quite well with double kicks. After winning, we get the HM for Surf, which is great for Gyarados to finally have a water type move, and the next thing the guide wants us to do is to surf over to New Mallville and help out Watson. This is an optional area, and we don't have to do it, but I go there anyway since the guide has it in there, and we are told to catch new Pokemon here, so I caught a Magnemite, which I named Robocop, and got the TM for Thunderbolt from Watson for helping him out with New Mallville, which is pretty cool, as we can use that TM later on if we need it. We continue along routes 118 and 119 where we get a good rod, have another interview where I just say, um, cut the tall grass using my Pokemon named Grass, funny how that worked out, since the guide said you can cut down the tall grass here with the cut HM, and eventually make it into the Weather Institute. It doesn't say too much about this area other than I can heal here on the bottom floor, and after defeating the Aqua Grunts we get a cast of form as a reward which I named Mike. I continue across the route after that where we have another battle against Professor Birch's kid, and the guide says nothing about this fight other than the fact that we get the HM for Fly after defeating her. It also makes note here of this bush right here and bushes that look like this in general on this route that you can use to make your secret base, and I don't know why it's telling us this late in the game when we got the TM for secret powers so long ago and passed so many places where we could have made a secret base. The egg that we got earlier on hatched into Wynut around here too, so I named it Sour Patch since it kinda looks like a Sour Patch kid, although I'll probably never end up using this. This leads us into Fortree City, one of the coolest cities in all of Hoenn in my opinion because of its unique aesthetic. Here we can shop for more secret base items if we want to, get the TM for hidden power by guessing which hand this old lady is holding a coin in three times in a row. Although the guide doesn't give us the answers for which hand she's holding the coin in every time, but then again it could be random, I'm not really sure how this works as it did take me a couple of tries to get the TM. Next up, we have to hit the gym as the guide says, although there is something blocking our way, so we have to go onto the next route where we meet Steven, who gives us the Devon scope that we can use to see invisible Pokemon blocking our way, like the one in front of the gym. This gym is a flying type gym, and the guide suggests electric, ice, and rock moves, so Magnemite that we caught not too long ago will be pretty good here. I use Magnemite for the early part of the fight until it eventually falls, 
Then switching to Dragon the Gyarados to clean up the rest of her team, giving us the 6th gym badge and the ability to use Fly outside of battle. We don't have any Flyers on the team right now, or much of a reason to need to use Fly as of yet, so I'll have to make sure that we have an open party on our slot to add a flyer later on if we end up needing it. On the next few routes leading into Lily Cove City, the guide makes quick reference to an ancient cave where we can catch one of the Reggies here later on, and I also want to mention that Suchinoko the Seviper has been one of our best Pokemon, although I haven't really talked too much about it. And as I make it into Lily Cove City, all of our Pokemon get to above level 30, which is great since Robocop evolves into Magneton here too. As we get closer to Lily Cove, we see Team Aqua talking about their evil plans as usual. Then the guide shows us the Safari Zone, and I try to go into it, although we can't yet since we need the Pokeblock case to enter. And in this game, you don't get the Pokeblock case until after you go into Lily Cove City. I just head right into Lily Cove City, and the first thing the guide tells us to do is battle our rival, and you guessed it, the guide gives us very little to no information about this fight too. We then go on a little shopping spree where I buy some lemonade since the guide said Duke is Pokemon like sweet things apparently. Check out the contest hall where we get the Pokeblock Maker, stop by the Pokemon Trainer Fan Club, and make a quick visit to the museum and the move deleter where I remove Cut from Blaziken. The next task the guide has in Lily Cove is to take on the Team Aqua hideout, but before we can do that we have a couple of other tasks to complete, like go to Mount Pyre. Here we can get the Magma Emblem by defeating all the Grunts here, which allows us to go back to the Magma hideout near Verdant Turf Town to clear them out as well. At this point I figured it'd be best to have a flyer now since we have to fly back and forth between a couple of different towns that are pretty far away, and since we have access to the Pokeblock case and the ability to enter the Safari Zone, I go into the Safari Zone and catch a Doduo to use Fly, and I name it Dodo Air. I then fly over to the Magma Hideout, and the guide details all of the rooms of the Magma Hideout nicely to make it pretty easy to navigate, but again makes no mention of the actual story elements going on here, like encountering Groudon for the first time, or battling Maxi. Next, we have to make a quick stop in Slateport City to find Team Aqua stealing a submarine, which they take all the way to Lily Cove City into their hideout. With all that out of the way, we can finally head back to Lily Cove to take on the Team Aqua hideout event, which is bigger and a bit more confusing than the Team Magma hideout we just visited. Although the guide barely says anything about the Team Aqua hideout, and just tells us to find our way to the end and pick up the Master Ball along the way. It also mistakenly calls these electrodes that we find near the Master Balls, Voltorbs. With all of that out of the way, we can now surf east and into Moss Deep City, and on the way we stop by the Treasure Hunter's house. Here we can exchange colored shards for different evolutionary stones, which could be cool for our Lombre to evolve into Ludicolo, although we need Dive in order to find the blue shards to exchange for the Water Stone, and even if I tried to get the Water Stone back at the abandoned ship, which a lot of people commented about in the Ruby and Sapphire as an intended video, I'd still need Dive, so we have to wait a little while before we can get a Water Stone in any way. At the end of the section about the Treasure Hunter, I thought it was funny how it says, quote, just bring your booty back to the house for the trade. I continue along into Moss Deep City anyway, where we get the Super Rod, explore around a bit, and finally the guide wants to take on the 7th Gym Leaders, Tate and Liza, with their Psychic-type Pokemon. The guide recommends that we use water and dark type moves here, and since I have Gyarados and a few dark moves on other Pokemon, I felt pretty good about it. The guide even suggested not too long ago to use one of the rods that we got to catch a Magikarp, since although it's weak with little care, it could turn into a strong Gyarados. So I guess the guide actually wants us to use Gyarados, which is great since I already have one. I did grind up the whole team a little bit before going into this gym fight, since there is a little bit of a level jump with the 7th gym, which is also a double battle gym and luckily I'm able to get through it on the first try with Dragon carrying the team for most of the fight, while other team members like Tsuchinoko, Grass, and Lombre chipped in a little bit. This gives us the 7th Gym Badge and the ability to use the HM of Dive outside of battle. Now we have to stop Team Magma from taking over the Moss Deep City Space Center with the help of Steven, then visit his house to get the HM for Dive. From here I check the back of the guide to see that Lombre evolves with a Water Stone, and I also see in the back of the guide that we can get a Water Stone from the Abandoned Ship, which the guide thankfully details as well. I go over to the Abandoned Ship near Duford, and now that we have access to the HM Dive, we can finally find the Water Stone and I use it to get our Ludicolo. From here we have a lot of story elements to take care of, starting off with diving into the Seafloor Cavern where Team Aqua is. 
Here the guide actually references this Archie fight at the Sea Floor Cavern a bit here and it even suggests that we use electric type moves for his Pokemon which are good against his Pokemon like Sharpedo. This is the first time the guide gave us an actual tip for a battle that isn't a gym battle and after defeating him and causing Kyogre to flee the area, we have to go to Tutopolis City. The guy notes how an escape rope will be useful here as well after we defeat him at the Seafloor Cavern, and I don't know why since we can't use it in the water to bring us anywhere, and after defeating them in the cavern, we're automatically warped outside so we don't need to use the escape rope and it makes no sense. Once in Sutopolis, we are told that Kyogre and Groudon are fighting, and we're also told about a third legendary Pokemon that we have to find to help stop Kyogre and Groudon. We have to make it over to Pacifilog Town to find this Pokemon, which according to the guide is a small floating township built above a Corsola colony. The guide also makes some quick notes in Pacifilog here, like about Mirage Island, which didn't appear when I checked, and then the guide wants us to visit the nearby Sky Pillar. Here we have to meet Wallace and find Rayquaza, or maybe it's Rayquaza, I'm not really sure no matter how I say it, there's at least one person in the comment section saying I'm saying it wrong, and gets overly upset about me for pronouncing something wrong, and to be honest it doesn't really matter and I'm just gonna call it Rayquaza, but Rayquaza ends up flying over to Sutopolis, so we have to go over there to meet it. Rayquaza breaks up the fight between Kyogre and Groudon, and Team Aqua and Team Magma realize their wrongdoings and all is normal in the Pokemon world, so now we can focus on just becoming the champion again. Our next task is to battle Juan, the water type gym leader who is a new gym leader in Emerald version and didn't appear in Ruby and Sapphire. The guide recommends electric and grass type moves here so Robocop the Magneton and Mirror B the Ludicolo which recently evolved will be great here. The guide mistakenly lists his Kingdra as being just a mono water type although it is also part dragon but luckily our electric type Pokemon moves are strong enough to hammer away at him giving us the 8th gym badge. Now we can head on over to Evergrande City and in the section before entering the Victory Road area, the guide suggests to stock up on items before heading into the Victory Road at the nearby Mart, although the Mart that's being pictured in the guide isn't accessible until after you go through Victory Road, so it makes no sense to stock up on items there after you've already gone through the Victory Road. I have to fly back to a previous town to get some items and then head into the cave. The only thing to note in the Victory Road is the fight against Wally, and all the guide says here is that he has 5 Pokemon that are all mostly above level 40, and this will be a perfect warm up for the Elite Four challenge. We're able to lay down the law against Wally in two shakes of a lamb's tail, and now we have the big challenge ahead of us, the Elite Four and the Champion. The guide says that we should get all of our Pokemon to around the high 40, so I do that, and looking at the recommended types, we have most of the types that they recommended covered, which is fantastic. For Sydney's dark type Pokemon, I use mostly fighting and electric moves like the guide recommends, and Robocop has Thunderbolt, which is great, since the guide specifically suggests that you teach something Thunderbolt for Sydney's Sharpedo, except Sydney doesn't have a Sharpedo on his team. I guess they meant for his Crawdaunt, which also shares the typing of water and dark, which does end up working out, giving us our first victory in the Elite Four. Next up is Phoebe and her ghost type Pokemon, so we're relying on using Crunch from Suchinoko for most of the fight. The guide here says how, quote, this Sableye bears none of the weaknesses to the other Pokemon in its tier. I'm not really sure what that means, perhaps it's alluding to the idea that Sableye has no weaknesses in this generation. And then it goes on to say that the fight might last a long time and be a battle of attrition, so hope for a critical hit, which we luckily didn't have to rely on for the win. Kind of strange to see the guide specifically say that your best bet is to get a critical hit. Third up is Glacia and her ice type Pokemon, and even though she has two Glalies on her team, the guide correctly lists the first one as being a pure ice type, then says the second one is ice and water type. I'm not sure how you got the first one right and then messed up the second one, but this was one of the easier fights we've had in the Elite Four area thanks to Blaziken and Robocop, and up next is Drake and his Dragon-type Pokemon. The guide only recommends Ice-type moves here, which I have none of unfortunately, I think this is the first time that we didn't have anything of the recommended types for the guide, so this battle was a bit tricky. I had to rely on just going for strong moves like Drill Packs from Dodrio and Surfs from Gyarados into his Flygon, and then spam revives for the victory. 
and finally all that's left of the champion Wallace and his water type Pokemon. The guide recommends that we use elixirs here or at least have them if we don't have them already so I check my bag, see that I have some, and actually use some on Magneton since my Thunderbolt PP was rather low, and the guide says how electric is great here since of course everything except for his wish cash is weak to it, although the guide mistakenly says that his whole team is weak to electric when wish cash is the only thing immune to electric on his team. This battle was a bit of a grind since I was a noticeably lower level than his team, so I relied on glaring his Pokemon with Tsuchinoko or Thunderwaving them with Robocop a lot to be able to Thunderbolt them with Robocop since it was now faster as they were paralyzed. It gets to a point where his Ludicolo just spams double teams and becomes incredibly hard to hit, but we get lucky a couple of times to break through and knock it out. His last Pokemon ends up being my Lotic, which I paralyze and hammer away with Robocop for the victory, and with that, we beat Pokemon Emerald as Nintendo intended, or as intended. If you made it this far in the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing since it helps the channel a ton, especially since we're so close to 100,000 subscribers, and also consider checking out my other Pokemon videos too. In the end, I had a lot of fun with this playthrough, although I think this guide was the worst guide we've ever looked at in this series thus far. It had its fair share of mistakes, which really weren't too big, although a lot of small mistakes do add up from time to time, and it did give very little information on any important fights, or even some story elements, outside of Gym Leader fights and Elite Four fights. The strange thing about that is that this Prima Guide for Pokemon Emerald version was released after the Prima Guide for Gold and Silver, of course, and was released right before the Prima Diamond and Pearl Guide, and the Prima Gold and Silver Guide was pretty good, and the Prima Diamond and Pearl Guide was one of the best guides we've looked at and had so much information packed into it. It's strange to see how this one was packed right in between those two and was way worse. I'm curious to see what the Prima Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire Guide looks at since I don't have that guide, and the Ruby and Sapphire Guide that we looked at for the previous intended video was by a company called Brady Games. Luckily this guy didn't really have too many parts where I felt like I would have been completely lost or confused, although it did have a fair share of backtracking, especially in the early half of the guide, and it did have some funny things in it which I love in these older strategy guides. With all that being said, I just want to thank you all so much for watching. Hope you have a great rest. If you love Papa C, you'll love Papa C Extra. This new channel is for the most epic Twitch highlights from the Papa C Twitch channel, both of which will be linked in the description. Come watch some of the best Nuzlockers in the world with me, from the most epic gamer ever. It's so poggers! So come join me over at the Papa C Twitch channel and the Papa C Extra channel. I'll be waiting! Ooh.